So this is lecture five of the Creativity and Computing module. This is the flipped version of the lecture to watch before we meet together on Friday. Our focus today is digital literacy. This is a contentious term, as I'm going to point out in a moment, but my focus really is about children's, young people's abilities with technology. The Grandma Potter Selwyn reading that you had a look at in preparation for the lecture covers a lot of that territory. Of what is it that children are capable of doing with computers? What are the sort of things which they enjoy doing with computers? And that's going to form the bulk of, of this lecture. So as I say, this is a contentious term. Nobody's, there's, there's not much sense of agreement about what we mean by digital literacy. Here's the Royal Society's definition from the Shutdown or Restart report, which came out in January this year, um, that digital literacy is really about basic computer skills, the ECDL type syllabus, the ability to use standard office packages, to be able to use the internet, um, and the sort of thing which a teacher in a secondary school ought to be able to assume that any child in their class is capable of doing, and thus by implication most of the children in year six, a good proportion of those in year five, ought to be able to do this stuff. It's very much a skills-based or functional skills-based approach to this. There's not, as I say, there's, there's not much agreement around this definition, although you might think that that's a perfectly sensible and valid one. But that's, to my mind, akin to saying literacy is merely the ability to read and to write. And of course, that is part of literacy. But surely our understanding of literacy is much more about the understanding of meaning and the conveyance of meaning rather than... <coughs> <coughs> rather than simply reading and writing skills on their own. So FutureLab here, back in 2010, have a more subtle, a more situated definition of digital literacy, or at least a more subtle situated understanding of digital literacy about communicating meaning and the process and, and an understanding of those processes which are increasingly mediated via digital technologies. So it is about conveying meaning, much like literacy is about conveying meaning and understanding meaning, um, but of course mediated here through a digital domain. Um, where are we going with this? Well, digital literacy is likely to form part of the new programme of study for the National Curriculum for ICT. The first version of the preamble, which was released by the British Computer Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering, um, took a slightly different tack to, to how digital literacy was to be understood, much more about the implications of technology for an individual's life or for the life of our society. Um, I draw your attention to this word critical in here, that that does matter if we're thinking about digital literacy. So they would argue in this document that it's not simply accepting these things but you know that understanding of how the document has been made and okay being able to find things on the internet matters but an awareness of how Google puts those results into order and where's Google's business model here that sort of understanding of the backstory to some of this is I think part of what we'd want an understanding of technology's impact to involve. I should refer you here to Doug Belshaw's work, or Dr. Doug Belshaw's work around digital literacies. You'll notice the plural there. 17 minute version of um, his views of digital literacy on his TEDx Warwick presentation. I'll put a link to that into Blogfolio for you. If you want to read the full version, his never ending thesis, lovely title that, is available online under an entirely free Creative Commons license. So um, at least have a look at the introduction, and give you, which will give you a, a, a much broader understanding of, of this territory, of this domain. Talking of Doug Belshaw, one of uh, Doug's other projects has been looking at this, this notion of the, what is the purpose of education. I think it's worth your pausing the tape at this point to stop for a moment and think actually what is the purpose of education? What is the whole thing for? Why educate children? Why educate students for instance? You know what what's the purpose to that? And it would be worth your thinking around that question. Now, you know is that something which you have talked about? elsewhere on the programme. What's your view of the purpose of education? Uh, back when I was trained to be a teacher, this was something which we did talk about, which we did think about. And this, this is the quote that impressed me most back then. R.S. Peters, one of the great philosophers of education, our concept of an educated person 
is of someone who is capable of delighting in a variety of pursuits and projects for their own sake, and whose pursuit of them and general conduct of life are transformed by some degree of all-round understanding. And for me, that, that kind of sums it up, really, that the educated person is someone who's, where education is about taking delight in things for their own sake, not merely for an ex, uh, a sort of instrumentalist view of to get something done. Um, but also that this, this notion of this all-round understanding, that it is a holistic view of life, that it's not just single isolated bits of knowledge, as, as some might interpret E.D. Hirsch as advocating, but it is that connectedness of a whole realm of knowledge. And this, this as you understand one part of the world of, of, of society, then that impacts on necessarily your understanding of the other aspects of society. Um, to see some of the other contributions to this this Purpose of Education project, um, do have a look at purposeed.org.uk. So here's uh, this classroom in my former school, is one of my former colleagues, and we've got a group of children there who are engaged in something which looks an awful lot like education as we'd recognise it. Don't you think? You know, there's purposeful activity there. Not a huge amount of technology, it's fair to acknowledge, but look, there's a rich variety of resources. They're all, I think, yeah, pretty much all, possibly not this little girl at the back here, engaged on the task. They all seem interested. We've got some sort of whole class activity going on there, and, and my colleague, they're very much in control of, of the learning that's taking place in this classroom. Um, does that chime with this this notion of education as Iris Peters defined it or described it? It's it's hard to see the connection there, but I'm sure it's not impossible to do so. And yes, an all an all round degree of understanding, the variety of activities that take place in this classroom has got to be part of that understanding, hasn't it? Here's another picture for you. Is this any closer to, to where education happens? This is what you get if you start typing into Flickr the search term teenager bedroom. Um, and this is very, very different in its, its appearance, isn't it? Uh, look at the amount of technology in here for a start. This, by the way, folks, is a video cassette recorder, which some of you may be familiar with, some of your parents, I suspect, may be familiar with. Our suspicion is that this is likely to be a boy's bedroom. We're not absolutely sure why, that, why we would conclude that. But look at the range of interests that this chap's got here. You know, there's very clearly a keen musician. He's got access to, to a whole host of technology. This is an old-style computer, isn't it? But, you know, we bet that there's an internet connection in there somewhere. We've got range of media that he's got access to here. Um, this is, is some sort of scanner. Is that a webcam that's up on the top there? Um, so, yeah, a whole host of interests that this environment supports. Is this any closer to what R.S. Peters is talking about in terms of education? A variety of pursuits and projects for their own sake. And his pursuit of them is transformed by some degree of all-round understanding. Well, perhaps there are hints of that, aren't there, in that sort of picture. So, yeah, education, the locus of education is not just the classroom. I think this is particularly true when we start thinking about ICT education. And perhaps the locus of ICT education is not even mainly the classroom. So much of our understanding of technology surely has come about through our use of computers and other digital devices away from the ICT suite, away from the classroom. It's nice when the two do coincide, but by no means inevitably so. So in terms of sort of some of the literature, some of the thinking around this, let's go back as far as Don Tapscott in 98, contrasting the net geners, the end geners, as he called them, with the baby boomers, the, the previous generation who'd grown up, grown up around TV. And Tapscott makes the distinction here between TV and the net, with the net being a medium which encourages you to be active, allegedly raising intelligence, certainly one of democratic participation. You don't have to own a TV company to be able to create content for others to see, to watch, to hear on the net. And something which is, is innately about building community. Innately? Well, I'm not sure whether that's innate, but certainly the network idea which underpins the internet is something which is very close to how many of us would envisage community happening. 
Uh, Mark Prensky, writing in 2001, coins the term digital natives. And at this point, you ought to really be aware that this too is a contentious term. And many, many experts in the field will say digital natives is not helpful language. But Prensky's argument then, um, he's to distance himself to some extent since, is that, that those who've grown up around this ubiquitous access to digital technology think differently to my generation, who have, have come to this later in life, or the digital immigrants, as Prensky describes us. Um, and that the teaching digital natives mean teaching students who, who do things very differently. And, you know, he gives us a list here of the sort of things which digital natives he sees as as being particularly happy with, being particularly familiar with. And, of course, uh, as, di as digital immigrant instructors are speaking an outdated language, struggling to teach a population that speaks an entirely new language. Is the distinction as sharp as Prensky makes out? Well, I wonder. But then again, I'm a digital immigrant, so perhaps might. Um, what does it mean by digital native? What do we mean by digital native? Surely it's somebody who's who's been born since this technology has been available. So many, most of you um, are, you know, under the age of 21 and thus have been born since the web was invented. Actually, it's slightly more than 21 years, isn't it, now? Um, this child has, was born after the invention of the iPad. And if I just swap over to my web browser, we'll have a look at some of the implications of that. Forgive me if you've seen this video already. Here we go. So is she a digital native? Has her has the way she thinks changed because of this very, very early exposure to technology? And is that a problem? Is that a good thing? Um, I'd be interested to hear your views on that. Let's move on. So you have this notion of the digital disconnect, that what children are used to using outside of school is often so much more advanced than the technology with which we provide them in school. There are real issues of digital divide here, um, that a child whose only access to technology is inside school is going to have a much more impoverished experience of technology than a child who's got access to that whenever, wherever they want, through the devices at home or nowadays through the devices in their pocket. Demos, writing about young people's use of technology, says they're actually pretty competent, pretty good with this sort of thing, that there are essential skills that they have to have, that of creativity, that of communication, and that of collaboration. These are now, core skills in a digital age. It's a helpful taxonomy. Oops, I beg your pardon. Back to that slide. Um, yeah, they talk about different types of users that, broadly speaking, young people are almost all competent as information gatherers and competent as everyday communicators. You know, folks, you're all perfectly happy finding information on Google. That's something which is routine now. And communicating with others using digital technology. That's something which we take for granted too. Um, you know, we talked at the beginning of the course about you know sending postcards and using technology for the, the what I did on my holiday activity. How many of you sent postcards, postcards over the summer? How many of you updated your Facebook statuses and shared the news about what you were doing with your friends that way? Um, but Deep must say there are higher order skills there. There are higher levels of use. And perhaps our role as educators is to meet children where they are 
and take them on to some place where they wouldn't have got otherwise to reuse the literacies to use Doug's term which they already have and then develop new literacies in them so being becoming creative producers and actually pioneers of digital technology themselves as you're perhaps starting to see with some of the work going on in Scratch. Um, a similar sort of time a year later from the MacArthur Foundation looking at this from an American perspective very very similar findings though um, but that young people are learning social and technical skills online they're learning that from one another as much as from their teachers though um, that there are opportunities but most aren't making the most of those opportunities so yeah hanging out online is something which many many American teenagers were doing but the messing around, the exploring, the experimenting with digital technology and the really pioneering stuff, which they described, I think, somewhat disparagingly as geeking out, um, is something which many young people weren't particularly interested in or particularly involved with. So, yes, a degree of digital literacy comes with them into the classroom. And I think this, this chimes with what you read in Kramer Potter Selwyn. But there is stuff which, which they're not going to get to unless we as teachers intervene and do something to help them along that journey. Okay, I want to share with you some of my own research now. This was a project done with a man called Terry Friedman, independent ICT consultant, uh, which we did, oh, it must be about four years ago now, investigating the question about what were children doing with technology away from school. We called this, what are your kids learning when you're not looking? And we did this. It's, it's low... Um, it's not particularly high caliber, you know, gold standard academic research. So for a couple of weeks in December 2008, as I say, four years ago now, I put out this survey and invited young people to come and fill this in. Tell us about what they were doing outside of the classroom with technology. So this is done as a very quick Google Docs spreadsheet form. We asked a few demographic questions. We asked about their access to technology, how they use the Internet and computers at home, their experience of filtering of the Internet, um, their use of social networking or thoughts about social networking in school and then to make some comparisons between their use of technology at school and at home. So not entirely dissimilar territory to what Kramer Potter Zelwin covered somewhat more expertly. Um, our sample was by no means representative and I'm making no claims that it was. About 75% of our sample came from England with those significant contributions from of all places Austria plus America and Scotland. Um, most of the people responding to the survey were the top end of primary school, lower end of secondary school. And again, there's, there's no claim made about this being representative. Probably about two thirds male, one third female. Okay. So what technology back then did they have access to? Well, pretty much what you'd expect. Computer was very high, over 80%. Games console, notice the gender gap there. Uh, the blue bars are for the boys, the red bars are for the girls. MP3 players, digital cameras, tailing off down the end here. But notice even back then, about a third of them saying that they had access to 3G mobile internet, which surprised us, I must say. How are they using the internet? Well, for doing the sorts of things which children, young people generally would like to do. So playing games, again, notice the gender gap. Um, for communicating, for watching video, for listening to music, for looking at pictures. These are not surprising findings. But look down the bottom of the list here. So getting better ICT skills, not at all of interest to them. Okay, that's perhaps something we were doing in school. But what a shame about this stuff. Sharing pictures, not at all popular. More popular with the girls than the boys, but not a significant use of technology. Uploading video, again, not a hugely popular thing to do. Writing blogs, making websites, not something that they were choosing to do in their own time um, when they were using the internet. What about more generally using computers? Again, very similar findings. Playing games, making music, very high. Writing things, interestingly, high on that list. Um, using computers to help with schoolwork should be on this list too. Um, surprised that they, these were as high even as they were. I sample, as I say, almost certainly not representative, but 20% saying that they use computers for programming, which really was, was very interesting to see. Um, so, give examples of things which they learnt using technology which weren't related to schoolwork. And this is the sort of, what do we call this? This is the wordle cloud of the, the, the terms which they typed into their answer to that. So, games, interestingly. But Facebook, again, not particularly, surprisingly. 
Um, YouTube is obviously a source for a lot of learning programming is coming up here. Um, and of course using the internet. Some more examples. So this is the text just looking at which word comes up most often. Um, and then let's go into some of the detail here. These are secondary school children. Surprisingly geeky stuff, really. And a few some from the sort of upper primary, lower secondary age here. I love this one. Wikipedia lies often. And Boy of Eleven financing from playing football manager. Girl of Twelve, how to program my laptop. Boy of 16, at the governmental structure of the early Roman Republic. I assume that's through playing a game, but who knows? Uh, so this is one of my own pupils back then. Eleanor, at the age of 11, my mum taught me people's email addresses. But I taught myself how to actually email. I just clicked most of the buttons until I found the right one. I also taught myself a lot of diseases, as I would love to be a doctor. For this, I mostly use the internet. I once also worked out how to use Google Earth. I'm not a very technical so this was a big leap for me. I simply fiddled around with the buttons, picking the ones that I thought would do the job. After just half an hour, I found my house. I don't actually know why I kept at it. Probably wanted to learn something new, as usual. Isn't that lovely? Is that not the mark of a digital native, if we're going to use that sort of language, that sort of willingness to explore, willingness to use the, the internet as a place to, to learn things for the sheer enjoyment of learning them. I'm going to have to put that R.S. Peters quote back on screen at this point, aren't I? Yeah, Delighting in a variety of pursuits and projects for their own sake, whose pursuit of them, general conduct of life, transformed by a degree of all-round understanding. Here we go. Uh, what do you like doing with technology at home? This is really very, very stark. It's very clear what they enjoy doing. It's playing games. There are other things too. Facebook, of course. In school, you get a much more diverse pattern. And that's important, I think. Games still featuring very heavily here. I think that was surprising to us. Isn't that charming? Everything. Making and creating. I was delighted to see that emerging in the things which they answered. And which websites do you think you should be able to get access to? This came up a lot in this. So YouTube is mentioned one, two, three, four times at very least here. And I suspect there are other occasions too. Facebook, facebook.com, www.facebook.com. Bebo, anybody remember Bebo? Um, even by then, sort of passing out of, of public enthusiasm. MySpace being mentioned too. As I say, it's getting a little old, this research. We then asked them how much they enjoyed using computers um, at home and at school. Um, isn't this wonderful? You know, what other subject could cl lay claim to statistics like this? Do you enjoy your subject? Do you enjoy geography? Do you enjoy French? Do you enjoy ICT? We have here, what's that? That's 80 odd percent, 83 percent saying we either like it or love it at home. There is a difference when we bring it into school. That drops off somewhat and you might like to again pause the tape and think about why that might be the case. Why is it something which they enjoy so much more at home than they do in school? And is it simply about more choice about what they're doing when it's at home? And, you know, that's really quite disturbing, isn't it? But it's not as bad, perhaps, as the Secretary of State and all those who wrote to the Secretary of State would have us believe. And almost finally, what do teachers know about children's use of technology? If we ask the young people, what do your teachers know about what you can do with technology? And isn't that appalling? The colour coding here is by key stage, red for key stage two, through to purple, uh, blue for key stage five. So, what do teachers know? Over a third of them say their teachers know nothing about what they can do with computers outside of school. I think this might be a somewhat um, over-optimistic over 3% here, knowing everything. But surely there's a case here in assessment for learning terms, if nothing else, of finding out what the children can do before you go start a lesson teaching them stuff which they might already know, and thus waste both your time and their time. So an argument could be made for saying, shouldn't ICT in school be a little more like it is at home? You know, if they do enjoy it so much more at home, then shouldn't we try and make things in school a little bit more like that? 
So how could ICT at school be more like that at home? Well, it's about filtering as much as anything else, isn't it? Unblock it, access to websites, I assume, sites here, let us do something, um, internet, letting again here. So it's about permission, isn't it? Oh, the games comes up and Facebook comes up. But look, making is there too, which is nice to see. Surely that should be something which was happening in school as much as at home. Um, and then some of the written responses to those questions. Um, I'd, I'll let you read those for a moment. What do you reckon to that one? Let's put some pro, some pro, games programs onto Moodle. Well, why not? It's there for everything else. Sorry, flipped on too quickly. Allow students to learn on their own. Don't set a plan for learning. Wow. Let students find websites and resources on their own and make it less of a chore to do assignments. Don't set a plan for learning. I wonder how that would go down with your school experience tutors. And then some took a slightly different perspective and said, actually, no, it shouldn't be. The two are different places, and school ICT and home ICT are different things. And it's nice to see the sort of maturity of response there about, you know, it is different. School and home ICT shouldn't be the same. I want to point you in the direction of um, the Ofcom report about UK children's media literacy. This is a really serious, um, you know, big sample um, research project about how children are using media literacy. And I'll put a link to that up on Blogfolio for you if you want to do some more reading around the research and the data of what children are doing with technology outside of school. This really ought to bring us back eventually to scratch and this notion of moving children from consumers of t technology to creators of technology, from consumers of content to creators of content is something which is very much in, chi in tune with the ideals of the scratch project. So this also, this is a lovely little game which is at the foundation of the module. You know, we were planning this module a few years ago. Um, we looked at this game and this, this kind of set the, the idea for the project work on which you're based. This was one of the very earliest games that came in with Scratch. This is five years and six months old. Scratch is not much older than that itself. And the Scratch team was so impressed with this when they saw it. It's, it's sort of classic status. Here, let's have a look at Hallo, this. ich bin die Biene Maya und du sollst mich auf meinen Reisen begleiten. Zum Zum. 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 So we have a little sort of animation you see in here. Maya, help me bitte, die Blumen zu öffnen. Dann sag ich dir auch, wie es weitergeht. Lovely, authentic voices coming in. And now we have to open the flowers in the right order. And this is left with a puzzle. Oh, they've closed again, you see. I got it wrong. I don't like the sound that that one makes at all. Oh, and that one closed. I'm going to stop there, otherwise I'm just going to spend all of this time playing this game. Have a look at it yourself. And what I want you to do in the session is spend some time exploring the projects that children have, si have submitted up to the Scratch website and providing them with some feedback on what they've done. You know, a, a large part of your working life is going to be giving children comments on their work and providing feedback. And I'd like you to have that experience fairly early on of looking at some of these children's games and putting some feedback in there for them. I'd also draw your attention to the fact you can download this project and this is why I want you to do this so early in the module is so that you can get ideas for your own games by building on the ideas of others. Now, of course, the university has plagiarism rules. You must acknowledge any source, any work which, which you base your game on, even if you know there's no direct quotes or copying from it. If you've got an idea from something, please do acknowledge that. But it's perfectly permissible to do so. It's the equivalent of including a quote in an essay, as long as you acknowledge the source there.
The other thing which we're going to do in session is have a go at making a storyboard. I'll show you how Comic Life works, because I think that's quite a fun way of producing a storyboard for your game, especially now that you've hopefully got all the background and all of the characters coded up, so you can tell the story of your game using some nice digital technology like that. And I'll tell you about next time's reading when we get there. Okay, so hopefully that's it. What I'd like you to do now is post a question on what you've just seen up into the Blockfolio space. Um, and I'm going to stop the tape.